Hey everyone, welcome to a quick primer on pKa for organic chemistry. So what the heck is pKa? pKa is something that you should have learned about last year in general chemistry when we were talking about acid and base reactions, and the pKa comes from the dissociation of some acid into its ions. The extent of this equilibrium is determined by the Ka, or the acid dissociation constant, of the reaction. When we talked about pKa in Gen Chem, we often talked about that in the context of looking at different points on the titration curve. We're not going to do any of that in organic chemistry. What we're going to use it for is a comparison point, because we could give you a variety of different acids, say HCl, H2SO4, or some kind of H bonded to an R group that represents an organic acid and we could give you Ka values for those different acids, but they'd be just a little bit annoying to manage. So instead of using Ka values, what we'll do is take the negative log of the Ka, and that will give us the pKa value of a given acid, and those are usually closer to nice whole round numbers than Ka values are, they're just a little bit easier to read and remember. So as I've alluded to already, the thing that we use pKa's for most often in organic chemistry is comparing acid strengths. So if I gave you HCl, H2SO4, and some organic acid and asked you which one is the strongest, the pKa values would help you find that out. So it needs to be said that there are a lot of acids out there in organic chemistry and we're going to use a, a variety of them. So do we expect you to know every single pKa off the top of your head? No, of course not. But will you always have access to some reference where you can look them up? Also, no, not necessarily. So it's good to have some of these values just tucked in the back of your mind so that you can pull them up and use them when you are in maybe a quiz or an exam type situation. So for that, I like to have a few benchmark values to know so you can have these values in the back of your mind and you can say, oh, right, I recognize that functional group. I know the pKa value of that is blank. So I want to go through and give you some common organic functional groups, categorize them by their pKa, and do it in units of about five. That way, I always find it's easier to remember, um, with, of course, the exception of these ones down here. The numbers get a little weird in the negative range, but we'll come to those in a minute. I like to start at the high pKa end of this spectrum. If you have something with a high pKa, that means it's actually not a strong acid. So this is a lot like golf. We want our numbers to be lower to have a stronger acid. By consequence though, if you have a weak acid, that means its conjugate base is gonna be really strong. We'll explore some examples of that in other videos. On the other end, of course, we have low pKa numbers that mean they're really strong acids and that their conjugate bases are very weak. So some of the ideas about which are strong acids and which are weak acids might make sense as we kind of go along increasing in acid strength. So at 50 here, we're going to have CH protons that are sp3 hybridized. They make up basic organic functional groups. They're not very strongly acidic at all. Then if we move down to CH bonds that are sp2 hybridized, now we have more S character. That means more electronegative. That's going to be a stronger acid. At 40 pKa, we have kind of a weird value for H2, as in hydrogen gas. Now, you will never see hydrogen acting as a proton source in the sort of equilibrium that I drew on the previous slide. What this value is here for is actually just so that we can evaluate H- as a base. So this is not a value you would use as an acid. It's a value you would use to evaluate a base. Moving right along, around 35 you'll have NH protons that are sp3 hybridized and don't have too many other stabilizing factors. At 30, you'll have NH protons that are adjacent to some kind of aromatic system or have more conjugation available to them that's going to increase their acidity. At 25, we have CH protons that are sp hybridized. So again, increasing S character, increasing acidity. At 20, we have CH protons that show up alpha to a carbonyl. Resonance there increases the acidity of those sp3 hybridized H's. At 15, this is a good value to know for general OH acids. So things like methanol and ethanol are going to be around 15. Next, at 10, we have a variety of different groups. Um, the one that first comes to my mind 
is an OH that has nearby conjugation to an aryl ring. You might also have NH protons where the nitrogen is positively charged and also SH protons. Sulfur is more polarizable and better able to stabilize a negative charge than oxygen, so you get a higher acidity for sulfur than you would for oxygen. At five, we're really getting down there to things that are pretty acidic, so it may come as no surprise that at five, we start to see things like a carboxylic acid functional group. At zero, we have carboxylic acids that now have some kind of strongly electron withdrawing group on the opposite side to help stabilize a negative charge. Those are my kind of favorite, most common functional groups going from 50 to zero in five unit increments. And then below zero, these things are really, really strongly acidic. We have a few other very common functional groups that don't fit quite as nicely into my five unit benchmarks. So I've only given you a few here that are um, the most common and useful ones to have off the top of your head. At negative two, we have H3O plus. So that is just protonated water. We'll see that a lot as something that we'll do acidic workups with. So it's good to know that the pKa of that is around negative two. At negative three, we have H2SO4. That's gonna be a common reaction acid that we use. At negative four, we have a protonated carbonyl. That's pretty strongly acidic. It'll help us to have this value in mind when we go to carbonyl chemistry in the second semester. And then coming in at negative eight to 10, really, really strong acids are some of our favorite inorganic acids like HCl, HBr, or HI. So those are negative eight, negative nine, and negative 10, respectively. Those are my favorite benchmark values that I would recommend committing to memory so that you have them in the back of your mind, you can pull them out. And then if you have exactly these acids, you know it's pKa. Or if you have something similar, you can have a starting point and get an idea of approximately what its pKa might be. Once you have that starting point, you can increase the accuracy of your guess by comparing whether it has stabilizing or destabilizing groups nearby. That will tell you whether you should go higher or lower in pKa value. So let's say that we start with some alcohol that we don't exactly know what its pKa is, but we're going to start with a value around 15. If it has some stabilizing adjacent groups, so say an electron withdrawing group that's nearby, we could say, oh, the negative charge on the conjugate base would be stabilized by the electron withdrawing group. Then we could say that our starting value of 15 pKa is good, but we have extra stabilizing factors, so we want to decrease our pKa value, say by about one to five units. That's always a good guess to start with. The other side of that coin is, what if we have destabilizing groups adjacent to our acid? Say, for example, extra electron donating groups. If that's the case, then we would say, oh, those electron donating groups are adding more electron density to our conjugate base. That's not favorable. It's actually going to take our 15 benchmark value and make it a worse acid. So we would instead want to go up by, you know, somewhere on the order of one to five units. So you can see this in some of the benchmark values that we've already given you. You can see it here in our NH protons and here in our OH protons. Same kind of trend between these two, that if we have NH or OH protons, they're going to start out at approximately 35 or 15 pKa, respectively. But then if we put them adjacent to aryl groups, where we might be able to resonance stabilize a negative charge on the conjugate base, they drop in pKa by about five units each. So these are just rough trends. It won't always be five units. It could be less. It could be a little bit more. But if you have a good benchmark point to know, you'll at least be in the right ballpark for how acidic something is. So what else can we do with pKa values? We talked a little bit about deciding between acids which one is the strongest. Turns out that pKa values can also help you decide between bases, which one is stronger or weaker. And knowing the strength of acids and bases will help you be able to predict which direction an acid-base equilibrium might lie. Acid-base equilibrium might sound like something that we feel like we've covered in GemChem, but equilibrium really drives a lot of organic reactions, so we have to be thinking about it here as well. I'll use my pKa values to predict strong acids and bases and how those can play into acid-base equilibrium questions in other videos, so go ahead and check those out. Thanks for watching.